<laughs> Purchased by the guest while stationed in Thailand during military service, this Rolex watch holds a unique story. Thailand. The guest was influenced by pilots on Air America Airlines and Continental Airlines who wore Rolex watches and felt compelled to acquire one. Kept unworn in a safety deposit box for 30 to 40 years, the Rolex Oyster Cosmograph reference 6263 remains in pristine condition. If I have it correct. As you know, it's a Rolex. This particular model is referred to as an Oyster Cosmograph. Highly sought after for its immaculate state and unique features, this model attracts serious collectors. Along with its original receipts, warranty paper, brochure and both inner and outer boxes, this watch's value is significantly enhanced. Featuring screw-down buttons and a Mark II dial, the reference 6263 was produced for a limited time, adding to its rarity. An unfilled warranty paper and the foil sticker on the back with the reference number make this watch exceptionally collectible. Highly prized for its historical significance and craftsmanship, such watches are coveted by collectors. First thing that would wear off the watch. The date mark on the bracelet shows that it was made in the first quarter of 1971. The estimated auction value for this pristine, fully documented watch is usually set at $500,000 to $700,000. I guess I better start wearing this thing. <laughs> the guest purchased these beautiful bracelets at a garage sale 20 years ago. The bracelet just didn't fit into my scheme of things, so it was just kind of thrown in the bottom of one of my drawers and forgotten about. The bracelet was made circa 1940 and bears the mark of its maker, Raymond C. Yard. Yard was one of the finest American jewelers of his time. He was known for taking a lot of pieces like these English crystals and doing custom work for clients. The bracelet features English crystals, which are made from quartz crystal and carved from the back. We can see the figures of birds on the bracelet, which were reverse painted onto the piece. Although the crystal was originally clear, it was backed with mother of pearl to give its current vibrant color. The bezels around the piece can also be opened up to facilitate cleaning. Despite minor wear visible on the piece being a fine work by Yard, we can still expect it to command a value of six thousand to eight thousand dollars. Oh my gosh! Oh my goodness! I guess I better start wearing this thing. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, I, we, told, I told my wife I wouldn't fall out of the chair. Let's see the Chinese bamboo brush holder from the guest's great aunt Louis, who was a doctor in China in the 1930s. A letter describes it as a bitong, a classical Chinese brush pot likely from the Quinlong period in the 18th century. There's skepticism about its age, mentioned by an antique dealer in 1937, though it's correctly identified as an 18th century piece. In 1937, such items were accessible due to China's turmoil, reflecting a simpler time in the antique industry. It features intricate carvings of scholars and attendants in bamboo groves, a typical motif of the period. Carved texture and patina are remarkable, despite the recent dusting, preserving its historical charm. These details and bracket feet are characteristic of 18th century brush pots. Provenance, like the detailed letter, is crucial in valuing Asian art, which enhance its credibility and potential value by 10 to 15 percent. Its estimated auction value is 20 to 30 thousand dollars. That's amazing. <laughs> Um, I, we, told, I told my wife I wouldn't fall out of the chair. This charming secretary bookcase was handcrafted in 1771 for a couple married in Lisbon, Connecticut. The original owners, Ephraim and Mary Perkins, likely used it to store valuables and organize important documents. Made of Connecticut cherry wood, this piece is a true testament to local craftsmanship. Distinctive fan design at the bottom of the bookcase is a hallmark of Connecticut furniture. The curved shape of the shelves echoes the design of the pilasters, a beautiful detail. Even the brass handles were likely made in Connecticut, not imported from England. This charming Connecticut chair, with its elegant fluting, complements the secretary bookcase perfectly. The chair itself is estimated to be worth $5,000, maybe $6,000. But the real star of the show is the secretary bookcase, valued at an impressive $1,000. <laughs>
At about seventy thousand dollars really? to ninety thousand dollars. Isn't that wonderful? A renowned former football player named Alan Page brought a banner to the show. Found through an antique dealer's ad, his wife gave him the banner as a Christmas gift. This item was identified as a parade banner used after President Lincoln's assassination. The banner bore the inscription, Uncle Abe, we will not forget you, reflecting the nationwide mourning. From the smallest town to the biggest city, there were demonstrations, parades of mourning. There was a parade torch at the top that was used in nighttime marches. The appraiser admired the banner's shaft patina and color, noting its remarkable condition. The back of the banner also carried significant sentiment. The appraiser mentioned that mourning items for Lincoln are somewhat less valuable than campaign items. Nonetheless, the banner's special attributes elevated its auction value to be somewhere between fifteen and twenty-five thousand dollars. Oh my goodness. That's very really nice to know. Exactly, yeah. Before us sits a captivating bronze sculpture, a true masterpiece of refinement and elegance. It's a Japanese bronze cast piece. It's from the Meiji period, and it dates to about 1890 or so. Our guest received this keepsake as a gift from her mother, who was an antique dealer. This work embodies the unique aesthetic and skill of the Tokyo School of Fine Arts. The school is renowned for its rigorous training in Japanese art forms, such as painting, sculpture, ceramics, and printmaking. Two individual elements were cast independently, then brought together to form this stunning piece. This exquisite sculpture portrays the unconditional love between a mother and her child. This is very sort of sweet and, you know, it sort is. of a nice quiet moment. A more detailed inspection of this piece reveals flaws and evidence of repair, notably a crack on the arm and visible signs of restoration on the bench, given its excellent state of preservation, this remarkable piece is expected to have an auction value of... $25,000. Oh! <laughs> well, that's, that's very nice to know. Exactly, yeah. The guest presented one of the most fantastic groups of medals ever featured on the show. The items belonged to his mother's first cousin, who became a naval mine disposal officer during World War II. The medals included the George Cross and the George Medal, two of the highest awards for gallantry. The guest explained the George Cross citation, recounting an incident involving a mine with a delayed fuse. Things started ticking again. Oh. And he just had time to, as he described to me, dive into his trench before it blew up. The appraiser acknowledged the significance of these prestigious awards, recognizing the recipient's exceptional bravery. Although the bravery diffusing explosives couldn't be priced, the medals did possess commercial value, given the current market's high demand and their rarity. The estimated value was... £100,000. <laughs> On display is a captivating watercolour and ink sampler, a delightful example of artistic expression. This exquisite piece was presented as a gift to our guest by her father, it has an impressively rich family history, dating back to the year 1812. This charming piece was made by our guest's great-great-great-grandmother, who was only eight years old at the time. Taking into account the creator's early age at the time, this piece is a remarkable demonstration of her innate talent and skill. At its heart, this beautiful piece radiates joy and innocence, captivating all who behold it. The artwork features a painting and a poem cleverly titled The Little Plunderer that playfully addresses bird theft. In astonishingly good condition, this exceptional piece would have an auction value of $3,000 to $5,000. That much more. I can't do the math in my head. <laughs> With its intricate design and skillful weaving, this basket showcases the timeless allure of Native American art. Our guests stumbled upon this treasure at an antique store in San Francisco. The stunning basket has its roots in the cultural heritage of the Yokut tribe, a Native American tribe that inhabited the San Joaquin Valley in California. This incredible piece is carefully crafted in the iconic form of a Yokut bottleneck basket. And it is a lovely bottleneck, a nice flat top with a nice neck. This is called the shoulder right here. It is adorned with an intricate diamondback rattlesnake pattern, expertly woven with precision and care. 
While rattlesnakes were once the intended occupants, this Sursa 1900 basket was created for the growing tourist market. During that time, they were making baskets like this for the tourists, and the tourists loved the little figures on them. Oh, okay. However, there are some condition issues, notably along the rims of this piece. Despite minor flaws, this exceptional piece remains in good overall condition, and its value at auction is estimated at $24,500. No, I did not envision that it had gone that much more. I can't do the math in my head. <laughs> This desk was acquired by the guest's parents at auction. In fact, it came from this house. Yes, my parents brought it in 1949. And how do you know that? You got the catalogue. Oh, right, OK. The piece originally graced the halls of Wentworth Woodhouse, one of the largest country houses in Britain. Wentworth Woodhouse. Wentworth is a historic country estate in Yorkshire, commissioned by the first Merquis of Rockingham, Thomas Watson Wentworth. This escritoire was crafted from a blend of mahogany, walnut and kingwood, featuring an exquisite design on the top of the desk, dating back to the late 18th century, around 1760 to 1780. It exudes the timeless elegance and refined style characteristic of its era. Its drawers reveal meticulous craftsmanship, showcasing intricate corner inlays of lighter wood that create a distinctive fluting effect lighter wood to make it look like fluting, uh, which you get on, on classical columns. One of the, the difficulties about this piece, and let's pop it up. Although the interior wood remains remarkably preserved and shows the original colour of the blend of wood, the external wood has experienced bleaching over time. Following meticulous restoration to its original splendour, this exquisite piece is anticipated to command a significant sum at auction, estimated at... £10,000 in a it is, yeah. <laughs> Today, we showcase two etchings that have been preserved from a bygone era, allowing us to appreciate the artistic achievements of the past. These timeless works of art were passed down to our guest from his mother, who acquired them in 1935. Dutch, she was living in Harlem in the Netherlands and acquired them in between the wars for correct for pennies which was still probably a difficult time to buy art this remarkable pair of engravings is the work of legendary artist peter bruegel who was also known as peter bruegel the elder he was a flemish painter and printmaker who played a significant role in the dutch and flemish renaissance he was a famous artist in his day and he would have been hired by a dutch publisher to produce drawings which were then engraved by somebody who worked for the publishing firm these engravings were renowned as the finest satirical works in Europe, as evident from the witty captions described below the images. The fat chicken illustration offers a satirical look at the excess of food and drink, showcasing a chaotic scene of gluttony and revelry. In stark contrast, the thin chicken illustration depicts a scene of scarcity and desperation, with fingers scavenging for food and clinging to meager resources. The peasant kicking one of the fat people out the door. You have the emaciated dog down here. What do you think they're worth? The exceptional state of preservation and rarity of these pieces make them a true treasure, giving them a collective auction value of $20,000 to $30,000. <laughs> this remarkable artifact holds a significant place in history. It is the bugle that sounded the charge of the Light Brigade during the Crimean War. The Crimean War. Trumpeter William Britton, who narrowly survived the harrowing Battle of Balaclava, passed down this cherished relic to his family. This artifact is made of brass and still retains its original bugle rope, serving as a testament to its authenticity and historical integrity. The bugle bears visible scars of its tumultuous past, including a substantial hole at its horn end, inflicted by a Russian Cossack's lance during an attempt to seize it from Britain which ultimately failed. Um, Billy was here was lying on the ground um, and, a, and a Russian Cossack with a lance tried to come spear the bugle from him. Um, fortunately, it was held on by the cord. Currently housed at the Queen's Royal Lancers and Nottinghamshire Yeomanry Museum, this military artefact boasts unparalleled historical provenance. Queen's Royal Lancers and Nottinghamshire Yeomanry Museum this bugle symbolizes the bravery and sacrifice of those who served in the charge of the Light Brigade. At auction, its intrinsic value, reflecting its historical significance, 
is estimated to be 30 to 40,000 pounds. Thank you. On display is a breathtakingly beautiful painting, a true gem that showcases the artist's mastery of color, composition, and technique. This masterpiece has been in our guests' collection for over two decades, after being carefully selected at an estate sale art auction. This painting is the work of the renowned artist, Alfred Jacob Miller. He was known for his paintings of trappers and Native Americans in the fur trade of the Western United States. A lot of his pieces were commissioned by people, so they really didn't come out onto the market until after his death. This artwork is a testament to the beauty and grace of Native American culture. As a young woman stands by a stream, her spirit as free and untamed as the natural world around her. Its soothing beauty has a profound impact, calming the senses and captivating the heart with its serene and peaceful presence. The artist's renown and the timeless allure of the lost American West landscape have made this piece a highly coveted and valuable treasure. Considering its impeccable state of preservation and extreme rarity, this masterpiece is expected to fetch an impressive auction estimate of about sixty to eighty thousand dollars. No, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. I put this in my IRA account. <laughs> the first mistake after taking a look at this beautiful instrument is thinking it's a violin. This item is called a viola, and it belongs to the violin family, but it's significantly bigger. The viola was made by musical instrument maker Treffel Gervais. The viola represents one of the many instruments made in 1890. And he was born in Canada. I looked him up, 1863? Yes, sir. He then worked in Boston for three major violin makers or violin houses. Violas make one of the most distinct and warm timbres in the violin family. It's made from maple wood, and a viola made by Treffel Gervais is quite rare. The viola is also oiled with varnish to ensure it shines and is as physically appealing as its music. At auction, this beautiful and rare viola would retail at the price of $15,000. Very nice. Our focus turns to a remarkably gigantic piece of furniture. This guest purchased this mahogany chair from an antique shop. It is a prop made for filming a version of the Alice in Wonderland films. Alice in Wonderland, inspired by the surreal environment that Alice navigates, where normal rules of scale and proportions are often disregarded. The appraiser praised the chair, describing it as fit for a giant. With dimensions measuring 30.1 by 40.1 inches, its Chippendale-inspired design clearly identifies its origin as originating from Britain, with distinctive craftsmanship synonymous with British furniture tradition. The exact connection to the movie remains uncertain, as no production details have been identified. With its intriguing backstory and well-preserved state, this piece has an estimated worth of two and three thousand pounds for it. Is that all right? That is very good news. Is that good? This dress was given to her by her friend in 1960. The robe, a la Franques, or sackback robe, epitomizes 18th century elegance and extravagance in women's fashion. Pleats often created a Watu pleat named after Antoine Watu, falling gracefully behind wearers. Back pleats flowed luxuriously from shoulders to hem, defining its elegance. Renowned for lavish silk use, favored for sheen, drape, and intricate decoration, its silk is imported in Europe and made in England. Floral embroidery featured delicate blooms stitched with vibrant silk threads. It also has this cord dangling and these little pockets that have real wool inside. The appraiser valued the item as a masterpiece of fashion history. £40,000. Oh. Wow. Oh, don't. don't tell my granddaughter that. <laughs> this unique vintage glass was a surprising find at a local estate sale. The guest purchased the glass for a modest amount. Its design is both whimsical and stylish, embodying the mid-century modern aesthetic. Likely produced in the 1950s or 60s, this glass was made in a period known for bold and creative eyewear designs, eyewear design trends of the 1950s. The glasses are in fabulous condition and have a unique charm. Such pieces can often be found in vintage boutiques or online auctions. In such places, the glasses fetch a higher price than what was originally paid. What do you think this glass's value, combined with its condition and design, would be worth? 20 or 25 dollars. That's yeah, pretty yeah. good. It 
was in her grandmother's house. When she passed away, she inherited it. It was a Saturday Evening Girl Bowl, a piece of pottery from the Boston area. The Saturday Evening Girls Club was founded in Boston in 1899 by Edith Guerrier and Helen Sorrow. It provided educational and cultural opportunities for young working class women. The initials SG stand for Sarah Gauner, a significant artist employed by the group. Below is the date 9 11, indicating it was made in September 1911, revealing both the maker and the creation details. The details and how it is done. Carve the surface of the pottery and then they glaze around it. Sarah Gauner and others at the Saturday Evening Girl Studio used local clay for traditional ceramics, whispering its tale of artisan mastery and historical allure. The appraiser valued the item. Around $2,000. Oh this collection holds significant historical value and personal memories. The guest's grandfather was the first park employee Walt Disney hired for Disneyland with employee number 001. Disney was an American animator, film producer, voice actor, and a pioneer of the American animation industry, Walt Disney. Before the guest's grandfather became Disneyland's chief engineer, he built train engines with fellow machinists, including the first Disneyland trains, Disneyland Train. Holding Walt Disney in high regard, the guest's grandfather's dedication and love for his work were apparent. Among the items preserved are the grandfather's payslip and badges, all reflecting the era's charm. Have badges, he wore the workman's cap. The historical significance and pristine condition of these relics make them highly valuable. A single badge from this collection at an auction could fetch two to three thousand dollars. Given the rarity and excellent condition of the items, their total estimated value would be four to five thousand dollars. Right. The guest's Aunt Lucy was born in Fredonia, New York, and her father was a surgeon in the Civil War. After the war, she became a teacher and went to Hampton Institute in Virginia, where she taught Booker T. Washington around 1872 to 1875. The two formed a lifelong friendship, and Aunt Lucy maintained a close relationship with Booker T. Washington until he died in 1915. Booker T. Washington was a prominent African-American leader and one of the last individuals born into slavery. He published his autobiography, Up From Slavery, in 1901, which became a classic in African-American literature. Aunt Lucy and Booker T. Washington's friendship was extraordinary, and they exchanged letters and gifts in a collection. A letter in 1897 to Aunt Lucy by Booker T. suggested that he was selected as the first leader of the Tusky Normal and Industrial Institute. Then there was an invitation for a commemoration of the Institute. The collection also had the first edition of Booker T. Washington's book, which was signed for Aunt Lucy. The appraiser valued the collection of items brought by the guest at six to eight thousand dollars for the collection. Nice, yeah, wow. This is actually called an aquarium block. It's a clever item. Within a piece of glass, you have a fish and all its parts. Mm -hmm. You have the fish, you have all the parts, and you don't have to feed it. That's true. <laughs> items like these are pretty famous and designed by Alfredo Barbini an Italian glass artist and designer from a family of glassmakers. Seven, he became partners with Gino Cenedese, and they started making them around 1950. Aquarium blocks of these types come in different sizes. Made in 1950, this is one of the smaller ones, and it's really a gem. In today's market, this piece of glass, featuring a fish with beautiful designs, would cost... Today, it would probably bring between $700 and $900 in a retail store. Very good, very good. In today's special episode, we're shining the spotlight on the remarkable career of Norman Thewell, one of Britain's most treasured cartoonists, with an exclusive interview with his daughter and a showcase of his timeless artwork. Thank you so much for joining me here. Your father was obviously a very talented man. Tell me, when did he discover that he had a gift for making art? Well, as soon as he could hold a pencil. <laughs> Born in 1923, Thelwell's artistic journey began at a young age, fueled by his passion for drawing and his love for the countryside. Thelwell's big break came when he began contributing cartoons to Punch magazine, where his unique style and wit quickly gained attention. 
1952, he joined Punch, and Punch was a, a very, very popular topical weekly magazine. His ponies, with their endearingly chunky bodies and endearingly naughty antics, stole the hearts of readers everywhere. Thelwell's art was more than just cute ponies. It was a reflection of his deep understanding of the human condition. He poked fun at the quirks and absurdities of country life, from the hapless riders to the mischievous ponies that seemed to have a mind of their own. Beyond his iconic cartoons, Thelwell was also a prolific author, exploring a range of subjects that extend far beyond his beloved ponies and rural landscapes. All to do with property, so how did they come around? He was always looking for the ultimate place to live. As a master of his craft, Thelwell left an indelible mark on the world of art and humour, and his work remains a testament to the power of creativity and wit. Sadly, your father passed away in 2004, but like any accomplished artist, his works live on and horse riding's not going anywhere. Yeah, thank so. you so much for talking us through your father's story and for showing us his work. It's such a lovely, lovely collection. Thank you ever so much. In the hands that uncovered King Tutankhamun's tomb, we also find the delicate brushstrokes of Howard Carter. Carter was a British archaeologist and Egyptologist who discovered an intact tomb in 1922 of the 18th dynasty, Pharaoh Tutankhamun. These paintings were inherited by the guest from her father's family 20 years ago. My grandfather's first cousin, and when her house was disposed of, they came to me. Bearing the maker's signature at the bottom right corner, the piece was done with watercolors and is dated 1904. Depicted in the paintings are figures of Tutankhamun, as they appear on the tomb walls. While some of the paintings might look damaged, they are in fact accurate representations of what the artist saw on the tomb walls. Artworks by Carter are very popular, and these pieces are in superb condition. At auction, due to the significance of these items in 20th century archaeological discoveries, they are estimated to be worth. $6,000 and $8,000 a piece. A piece? A piece on a retail venue. Oh my heavens! Guest presented her grandmother's bracelet, an 18-carat gold bracelet made in Italy in the 1950s. A really great quality example of the use of multicolored gold. It has a 750 marking, indicating its authenticity as Italian gold, also featuring chunky and wide links, giving it a striking look. Despite its age, it's still in very good condition. This 18-carat gold bracelet adorned with chunky and wide links will have a retail value of... Would be in the neighborhood of $5,500 to $6,500. Do it. <laughs> wow, that's quite a bit. <laughs> On today's show, we have a number of fascinating antique items to showcase. First, we have a Derby Patchmark figure, manufactured by the Derby Porcelain Factory. This figure is notable for the small patch-like marks incised on its base, resembling a lozenge. Next, we're featuring a George III snuff mull crafted from a ram's horn with a silver mount dating from Circa 1760 to 1820. We also have a 19th century dusting brush, often referred to as a whisk broom or duster, which was a common household item used for cleaning surfaces like furniture, clothing, and small spaces. Additionally, we're displaying a 19th century French comfit box used to store comfits, which are sugar-coated nuts or seeds typically served as a delicacy or offered as gifts during special occasions. Another intriguing item on display is an 18th century brass tobacco box designed to store and carry loose tobacco, often used for smoking in pipes or for snuff. Finally, we present a French Art Nouveau cylinder box used for storing items such as jewellery, trinkets or keepsakes. One can only wonder how much these artifacts might fetch at auction. Exhibited on the show is a Star Cavalry Carbine Rifle, a fascinating example in the evolution of military firearms. Our guest inherited the weapon from her grandfather after he passed away. He kept it under his bed. When he passed away, I asked for that just because that was kind of special to me. The firearm was made in 1865 in New York by the Star Adams Company. It was produced for the Union Army under a contract during the later period of the Civil War. This rifle is a breech-loading carbine, designed to be loaded from the breech rather than the muzzle. By lowering the lever, a cartridge can be placed into the breech mechanism. Surprisingly, about 5,000 of these rifles were made, 
but none were issued or used during the war. Star got the order very late in the war, and they don't start delivering them until March of 1865. Well, of course, the war's over in April of 1865. And they were eventually sold as surplus. All parts of this rifle are intact, and it remains in pristine, unused condition, which could significantly increase its value. Due to its rarity and historical significance to the American Civil War, we can expect this piece to be worth between $2,500 and $3,500. The guest presented a gift from her husband, which has been a bone of contention for years because she thought he paid too much for it. So how much was too much? $2,500, which 20 years ago, it's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> this is a French lamp made of gilt bronze modeled after Louis Fuller, an American dancer and pioneer of modern dance and theatrical lighting techniques. This lamp with its beautiful glow was crafted by the French sculptor Raoul Lache. It depicts the amazing movements of the dancer. And this really um, fits that bill with the wonderful warm glow of the light. And she's really known for her sort of a billowing, gauzy outfits that she wore. And you can see there's the amazing movement. Featuring fine details of the drapery as it flows across her body, articulated beautifully. Why don't we put it on and we'll see what it looks like lit up. It has this beautiful glow. It's a, a French lamp. The sculptor is Raoul Larche, who was working in France in the latter part of the 19th century. This stunning piece, made of gilt bronze with a perfect glow when lit up, has a foundry mark and will have a price of... I would say for auction, I would estimate it between twenty-five and $35,000. Are you kidding me? <laughs> oh my goodness. The blue team are in an antique shop to purchase this pool plate. After haggling the price for a few minutes, they purchased the item for £150. Bargain hunt expert Mark Stacy confessed that Paul was not his favourite portrait. The auctioneer mentioned that Paul works were not desirable at the time, but would bounce back later. Hence, a conservative price at auction was estimated at £70 to £200. The bidding started at £50, with the auctioneer encouraging bidders to buy, as he believed that Paul works would be desirable in the near future. After a long bidding process, the item was taken for. An £80 repair. They might be unfashionable at the moment, they will come back. Presented before us is a captivating etching of great artistic merit. Our guest received this beautiful etching as a birthday present from his wife. This exquisite etching is a brilliant creation by the celebrated artist, Marc Chagall. He was a Belarusian French artist and painter most known for his work in the modernist movement of art. The Maternity Portfolio, released in 1925, features this exquisite work, among others. There are five etchings all together in this illustrated book. Around a thousand copies of the book were made. There's no mystery in what's going on here on the image. It's called the, the visit through the window. At the bottom of the illustration, Mark Chagall's distinctive pencil signature boldly stands out, a rare feature not typically found in this portfolio. This artwork masterfully captures the essence of its title, the visit through the window, as a figure is seen gracefully leaping through the window pane. The artist's signature is the final flourish, transforming this incredible piece into a highly valuable and highly coveted work of art. Given its exceptional condition and authenticity, this remarkable piece would have an auction estimate of $25 to $3,500 on it. So. Okay. Went about asking fairgoers to guess what this item, made of brass and a small steel lever, was used for. After many failed attempts, some people finally got it correctly as an instrument for skinning and bloodletting. It is an equipment scarification for bloodletting used in the 18th and 19th centuries when excess blood in a patient was seen as the reason for an illness. Um, and basically, these were the days when an excess of blood in a patient was considered to be the reason for the illness. Hence, it was used to let blood out to make the patient better. Stefan Dunning, director of the Bath Medical Museum, revealed it was used by barber surgeons, which marked the origin of the barber's pole, where the red colour symbolises blood and the white symbolises bandages. The origin of the barber's pole. Uh, with the red and white stripes, uh, because the red would symbolise the blood. There was also a case containing autopsy instruments for post-mortem examinations in the 18th and 19th centuries. 
The bronze patches are from the Bath Hospital, known as the first specialist hospital in the UK that specialised in water treatment in the 1700s. They date from the 1700s and when they uh, had the patients in the wards, they would allow them outside of the hospital. The patches were put on patients during bath treatments for identification and the medicinal importance of these water treatments is still in use today. It would be to try and remove the badges from their tunic so that if they were in a pub drinking, they would not be caught. This unusual item looks like a foreign rug, but it is not. In fact, it's a type of bag called the Turkmen Shuval. Shuvals were used in the 19th century by Turkmen as storage bags. From Turkmenistan. It's a Turkmen storage bag. It's not really a saddlebag. It was woven by a Turkmen subgroup known as the Yomuds. They're a, a semi nomadic tribe. The design on this particular Chuval is so attractive and appealing, and it shows the creative design background of the Turkmenistan people. It was created by a subgroup of the Turkmen called the Yumud tribe. The weaving material is wool on wool, which is very appealing. For a beautiful piece of Yomud creativity, this Shuval storage bag would auction at $5,000 and $7,000. Dollars? Yeah, dollars. <laughs> That's a really good piece. That's a My nice goodness, thing. I had no idea. Yeah. The combo of this letter and signed photo is quite a special one. This is because it was signed by Gutzon Borglum, who was the sculptor of Mount Rushmore. In contrast to what many may think, this letter had nothing to do with Mount Rushmore. The letter was, in fact, written to address the reintroduction of bison into the Great Plains. What's interesting about this photograph is that it was taken when Mount Rushmore wasn't finished. But, more interestingly, when you look at the photo, there's an unfinished sculpture beside Washington's sculpture, which is not present today. Washington doesn't exist on the monument today. The story of Learn is that because as they got it partially carved like that, they discovered that there was such flaws in the rock on his face. This signed photo and letter is truly remarkable because it is rare to see such items. At a suitable auction, these valuable signed items would be worth. Be worth a thousand to twelve hundred dollars. Cool. Very cool. We have some antique items on the show today. Firstly, we have a walking cane, known as the Carlton Club Cane. This cane is distinguished by its intricately designed handle, featuring the emblem or insignia of the Carlton Club. Secondly, we present a sapphire brooch, made of 9 karat gold, with a precious stone at its centre. Another item on display is a silver frame thermometer, featuring ornate silverwork adorned with repoussé designs. Also showcased is a Coleman's mustard tin, from the early to mid 20th century. It features the brand's bold yellow and red color scheme, with the Coleman's logo prominently displayed. Another exhibit includes Border Fine Arts cats, characterized by their detailed and lifelike sculptures. The attention to detail in their fur, posture, and expressions make them particularly sought after by collectors. Lastly, we have a decoupage Victorian box from the Victorian era, featuring floral motifs, intricate patterns, and scenes from everyday life. We are left to wonder how much these vintage household objects would command at auction. A suit worn by Arthur, Paul Newman's brother, while standing in for Paul in the 1969 film Winning, was recently appraised. It was found to have significant historical and sentimental value. Arthur and Paul looked and sounded very similar, allowing Arthur to substitute for Paul seamlessly. This was particularly helpful in scenes requiring high-performance racing. Arthur filled in for Paul in about 25 to 30 films. He was also a respected member of the Directors Guild of America. The suit, tailored to match Paul's, is tied to the film that sparked his racing passion. Its association with fast cars and professional drivers boosts its value significantly. Arthur's contribution to Paul's career was also featured in the 2015 documentary Winning. This emphasizes the suit's value from a pivotal moment in Paul Newman's career. While examining the condition of the item, the appraiser said, I think an auction estimate would probably be around twenty to thirty thousand dollars. Wonderful. For Paul's, I think an estimate at auction would be at least eighty to one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Wow. They both would be very happy. If you were going to insure this, I would probably put it at at least fifty thousand dollars. This letter and manuscript combo provide insight into one of the world's greatest minds. The combo was written by the legendary writer Ernest Hemingway. 
The manuscript is special because it takes us through Hemingway's thought process. It's believed that the manuscript came from a draft of one of Hemingway's works in 1925. He writes a sentence, then he has a second thought, crosses it out, writes a new version of that same sentence. So this is what we call in the field of manuscripts a working manuscript. The letter, on the other hand, is sort of a critique of Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway was a cult hero among writers back in the day, so this manuscript is valuable. He also had a thing for slanting his handwriting, so this is a legitimate piece. This combo of Hemingway's letter and manuscript is truly remarkable, and because of this, they would auction at a price of Red Team was shown a 3-in-1 photo frame made by Asprey. On the photo frame is inscribed, Asprey's and Sons, which was one of the famous jewellers in London. The most beautiful part of this piece is the middle frame, which is different from others. Asprey was a loved artist, and his pieces are very desirable. The Red Team bought this photo frame for £227. It was estimated at a conservative auction price of £150. At the auction, Bidding started from £100 and quickly climbed too. 170, 180, 190, 185 new bidder, 190. Expert Thomas Plant and the Blue Team saw an interesting miniature cooking range in an antique shop. This miniature cooking range has plastic handles and is usually set in a toy box. You could put this cooking range in your kitchen as a decorative piece because it is beautiful. It is complete and in great condition, with its lids and plastic handles. Hence, the price estimate at auction would probably be between 20 to 30 pounds. However, the team bought this item for 35 pounds and were hoping for a profitable sale at auction. At auction, the bidding began at 10 pounds, and after some haggling, for some moments, it was finally sold for. In green, one more. 45. This extraordinary collection of Charles Schultz comics holds a significant place in both pop culture and personal history. Charles Schultz A profound connection with Schultz is shared by the guest, who collaborated with the legendary cartoonist for over a decade at Hallmark. Hallmark Cards, Kansas City, Missouri Featuring Peanuts characters on greetings cards was the guest's visionary idea, leading to an iconic product line that delighted millions. He would come up with the ideas for the greeting cards. He would do the pencil sketches, send them back, and we'd come back with, with little fixes like make this a full figure or add bells here. Included in the collection are original comic strips, intricate pencil drawings, and unique pieces of artwork by Schultz. Among the treasures is the rare Snoopy's Daily Dozen exercise booklet, showcasing Schultz's charming and timeless illustrations. Original sketches with the guest's penciled notes are also featured, testifying to his and Schultz's creative collaboration. Market freshness, vintage appeal, and the presence of beloved characters like Snoopy and Charlie Brown determine the collection's value. Historically very important, and a conservative estimate on that would be four to 6,000 as a group. When you come over here, it's only a game. Reflecting their rarity and demand, each daily exercise panel is conservatively valued at. He's at four to six thousand each. With its historical significance and pristine condition, this collection's total value could soar to. 150000 to 200000 dollars on a piece-by-piece piece basis. Absolutely not. And if you're gonna insure it, you'd probably want to insure it for a little bit more than the highest. I, I was going to say I, I had these on a shelf in my closet. Expert Kate Bliss found this interesting romantic jewellery, known as the Edwardian Love Token. It is a well-sculpted gold brooch, having a swallow surrounded by a heart. This kind of romantic jewellery is always in fashion, with its aesthetic style from the 1890s, which is connoted by the heart and swallow. Kate and her team bought this piece of jewellery for £38 and hoped it would sell well at auction. However, auctioneer Tin Winnicott estimated the piece at auction for £40 to £60. The bidding started at £32 and continued to grow until it was taken for. 38, 40, one more way out. One for luck. Yes. Thank you, sir. Good man. <laughs> A watch was brought by the guest, which had been inherited by her husband. The item originally belonged to her husband's great-grandfather, a miner from England. 
the appraiser described the watch as a beautiful American pocket watch made by E. Howard and Company of Boston, likely around 1890. They were renowned in the American watch industry for crafting some of the finest timepieces. The particular watch was notable for its chain and the decoration on its case, both made of gold quartz. It was a box hinge hunting case watch with multicolored gold decoration and a diamond. The appraiser noted it as the highest grade of watch case available at the time. The remarkable piece was in pristine condition, exhibiting exquisite craftsmanship. Due to its exceptional quality and historical value, the recommended value was be fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. David Barbie and his team were in an antique shop to buy something unusual and expensive. Carvings of this kind are always sought after at auction. It is a little mechanical scale carved as a bear called the Black Forest Bear. The original price is two hundred pounds, but was purchased by the team for £190. However, the auctioneer has issues with the object as he wondered why a mechanical gadget would be attached to a wonderful carving. The bear itself is a beautiful work of art, but for auction sale, it would likely be sold at £40 to £60 or more. Bidding started at £80 and eventually soared until it was finally sold for. 100, 110, 120, 130 here, 140, 150, 160, 170. The guest displayed a painting that he and his wife had purchased at an open house. The piece was identified as the work of Bessie Lowenhaupt, a renowned artist from St. Louis. The appraiser provided insights into the artist's early life and career. Bessie Lowenhaupt was born in 1881 in Mount Vernon, Indiana. She studied at the Chicago Art Institute. The painting, an oil on canvas dating Circa 1960, it exemplified Lowenhaupt's distinctive style blending abstraction with reality and employing planes of color to achieve harmony. Lowenhaupt often favored a dominant color in her compositions, which she termed the master of ceremonies. Despite her unique approach, she only held one commercial exhibit in 1968. The painting bore two titles inscribed on the back. Despite lacking the original frame, the guest was delighted with the high appraised value. Four and six thousand dollars. That's great, thank you, I appreciate that. The red team was enamored by a pearl pendant with its chain because it was in perfect condition. This piece received a seal of approval from expert Paul Laidlaw and auctioneer Anita Manning. It is a delicate and stylish pendant made of pearl. Moreover, it is known as a Paul Edwardian pearl pendant and its good quality. Auctioneer Anita Manning estimated the cost of this pendant at auction between 120 to 160 pounds. However, the red team bought this pendant at an antique shop for £100. The bidding began at £200, but only one offer came in, which is 100 bit. It's beautiful. A guest brought vintage suits to an appraisal show, recounting her acquisition in the late 90s. She had purchased the suits from the estate of a deceased socialite in San Francisco. The appraiser identified significant differences between the two suits. The first suit, dating from the late 50s to early 60s, was a custom-made Chanel Couture piece, entirely hand-finished. Our guest was surprised to learn it had been custom-fitted, noting it fit her perfectly. The suit included the matching blouse and lining. The second suit, from the late 60s, was a Chanel boutique piece, which was ready to wear. The appraiser remarked the old size 14 label, equivalent to a modern size 8. Given the condition, the estimated value was determined. Tail value is probably about 1800 This suit is probably 3500 and 4500 Bargain hunt expert Mark Stacy and the blue team purchased a Pan Piper bronze figure. The team wanted something big and heavy, and a member of the team checked by lifting the object. It looked brand new. However, it is made of bronze, patinated, casted, and very attractive. This object is from the late 19th century, and at the time, was worth around £46,000 or more. But, as an antique, an auction estimate for this bronze figure is about £150 or more. Auction started with bidding from £50, and it continued to increase. Eventually, after a long bidding process, the item was sold for. 220, 220, 240, 260, 280, 300, 220. The guest brought a silver cup to an appraisal show, 
mentioning she had acquired it at a flea market for just a dollar. Upon noting some marks on the bottom, the guest became curious about its origin. The appraiser then revealed that the cup is an American silver piece, crafted in Boston, Massachusetts, around 1710. The mark identified the maker as John Dixwell, a notable Boston silversmith. The appraiser clarified that American silver makers had ceased using such hallmarks by the 19th century. The item, being nearly 300 years old, exemplifies 18th century American silver craftsmanship. Given its excellent condition, and rarity, the appraised auction value was two to three thousand dollars. Oh my gosh. The guest brought a small set of boxes that were inherited from her father-in-law and mother-in-law. The in-laws, who were passionate collectors, obtained these boxes from England. The appraiser identified the boxes as 18th century English pieces, crafted either in South Staffordshire or London. These boxes were traditionally exchanged as tokens and trinkets among loved ones. The appraiser explained their use as patch boxes, intended for storing beauty spots. So a lady would keep her beauty spot in here. She would take one out on her little finger, and she'd place it in the prerequisite position, checking for the mirror inside the box, it's in the right place, and then replace it. The collection included boxes from Harwich, Lemster, and Lymington, with one box bearing a notable inscription. Additionally, the appraiser highlighted two charming 18th century French enameled boxes. The collection had some cracks and chips, which impacted its overall worth. Despite this, the total value of the collection was $3,000. Imagine folks seeing these toys in your living room as an adult. Many of them wouldn't know how special they are. These toys are called Buddy L toys after their manufacturer of making fenders for full-size cars and he was so tired of seeing his son's toys getting so broken up that he started making toys and they were some of the finest toys ever made due to one predominant fact they were made by a company called Buddy L who probably made some of the finest what we call press steel toys ever made which was that their steel construction was among the most solid in the toy making industry this is what we call the flat top roadster, and this is called the roadster pickup. Another special fact about the toys is that Buddy L was known for making trucks, but these toys were one of their finest sets of full size toy cars ever made. Due to their strong steel make, these toys at auction today would retail at. I would fully expect at auction to bring sixteen to seventeen hundred dollars. This exquisite piece of craftsmanship. A Bradley and Hubbard lamp is a testament to timeless design and quality. Inherited from the guest's grandfather, who acquired it in the 1930s, the lamp embodies decades of family history. Bradley and Hubbard, founded in 1852, were celebrated for their artistic and high-quality products. Bradley and Hubbard. The lamp, identified by a distinctive triangle and lantern mark, showcases neoclassical motifs and patented metalwork. And we have a lot of neoclassical motifs. We have the large urn and scrolling vegetation here and floral devices, ribbons, etc. Curved glass panels and an above average base highlight its superior craftsmanship. A replacement finial was added to it and complements the lamp's original aesthetic. Despite a crude restoration, a professional touch could significantly enhance its presentation. With proper restoration, however, this Bradley and Hubbard lamp, one of the finest seen on antique markets, would be worth four to five thousand oh. dollars. Let's travel back in time to one of the greatest eras of the Detroit Tigers. This photograph represents the Detroit Tigers team of 1909, who won the American League. As successful as the team was in 1909, however, they could not win the World Series. The leader of the team at the time was the famed baseball player Ty Cobb. As leader of the team, Ty was quite famous for setting 90 Major League Baseball records in baseball. The team, at the time, was filled with immense talents, including Sam Crawford. This photograph is quite rare, because there are not many pictorial representations of the team. If this were to be auctioned at a sports auction, this photograph would sell for $5,000. This bamboo cane has a handle carved into a Dachshund's head, adding a personal touch. Bamboo walking canes were popular in the late 19th 
and early 20th century Europe admire the charm of this crafted cane. See the carving, I mean, it's a very realistic, I guess it's a greyhound. Yeah, it looks like a greyhound, like doesn't it? But you've got a lovely patina on it as well, where it's been handled. Walking canes were both mobility aids and fashion statements. The detailed carving suggests a custom-made cane showcasing refined taste. The handle's intricate carving enhances both function and style. The cane's design and materials make it a valued collectible. Its unique charm shone through, and the man valued the item. 65 quid be a good help to you. Ooh, no. Many folks believe pearls are all the same, but they come in different shapes and sizes. For example, there are cultured round pearls and the South Sea type, which are the most expensive. Cultured pearls usually come in a creamy color, which enhances their appeal. Then we have another set of pearls, which were made in the 1950s. A classic look, uh, they're mashed up with diamonds, although it's still about the pearl. Uh, 11 millimeter Japanese Akoya. These pearls are mainly Japanese Akoya pearls, and they are extremely rare. Another type of pearl you might see are these oddly shaped ones. Finally, we have Tahitian pearls, which have a full color spectrum and are also visually appealing. The majority of these pearls are unique and housed in Doc's Oyster House in Atlantic City. At an auction, these magnificent pieces of jewelry would retail at the price of $2,500. I know we have only scratched the pearly surface of information here, but Kevin, thank you very much. These silver owls caught the eyes of expert Catherine Southern. They were made by a well known maker and are of beautiful quality. The two silver owls are novelty silver and are firm and old. Before auction, these exquisitely done pieces were estimated at £60 to £80. The auction began with a bidding starting from £40 to £50, and the owner had bought this piece for £140 from an antique shop, but they were eventually sold at the auction for. During his stint in Stuttgart, Germany, the guest stumbled upon a pair of vintage posters at a downtown flea market, one featuring the picturesque Bellagio and the other showcasing the serene beauty of Lake Garda. Both posters showed signs of wear and tear, prompting the guest to invest in professional restoration and linen mounting upon returning to the States. During the restoration process, meticulous recreation of missing paper, repair of prominent creases and filling in losses all were carefully executed to preserve the poster's integrity. It's uh, is like canvas. Right. And on top of that, they have put acid-free paper. An investment in professional restoration not only revived the posters, but also significantly enhanced their market value. At auction, the estimate highlighted the substantial appreciation in value post-restoration. At $2,400 to $3,600. Excellent. Nice. We love them. We're keeping them. But uh, that's great. Here, we have an original mask from the first episode of The Lone Ranger. Unlike the later black mask, the first version was plaster of Paris, covered with purple felt for contrast in monochromatic films. The guest's father, a film industry insider, became friends with Clayton Moore, who gave the signed mask to their family. He signed the mask with a personal message, Clayton Moore, The Lone Ranger, and Layla too, dated 1951. This mask was used in the episode Pete and Pedro, but Moore eventually replaced it with the black mask. Correct. He did not like this mask because it covered too much of his face. He designed the black mask as it's known today. It was comparable in significance to Judy Garland's ruby red slippers and has amazed everyone who's seen it. This Lone Ranger mask is a truly remarkable and iconic piece of television history. Due to its historical importance, unique color, and personal connection to Clayton Moore, at auction, it is valued at least $25,000. Oh my gosh. At an auction, who knows what could happen? Oh. <laughs> it's a wonderful piece. Yes. Crafted in 1862 by the renowned Minton Company, this fountain boasts a vibrant glaze with a subtle opalescent sheen inspired by French techniques. And there was a man named Minton who had traveled through Europe and going through the French region of Rouen in 1849, he found a type of semi-opalescent glaze. The base of the fountain features a captivating sculpted mask. The date cipher. So if we look on the bottom here, you will see that triangle and cross conform to the year 1862. From this mask, elegant swags cascade downwards, resembling intricately detailed leaves. The artistry extends to the handles sculpted into intriguing masks that add a touch of whimsy. 
the presence of a monogram hints at a fascinating history, possibly connected to the famed poet Alfred Tennyson. While the exact function remains unclear, the fountain is a striking display of artistry and craftsmanship that is worth. About thirty to fifty thousand dollars. No! It's a wonderful <laughs> piece.